Book Two, Chapter One, Part One of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter One, The Radiant Hour, Part One of Three. After a fortnight. Anthony and Gloria began to indulge in practical discussions, as they called those sessions when, under the guise of severe realism, they walked in an eternal moonlight. "'Not as much as I do you,' the critic of the Belle Lettre would insist. "'If you really loved me, you'd want everyone to know it.' "'I do,' she protested. "'I want to stand on the street corner like a sandwich man, informing all the passers-by. "'Then tell me all the reasons why you're going to marry me in June.' "'Well, because you're so clean. "'You're sort of blowy clean, like I am. "'There's two sorts, you know. "'One's like Dick. "'He's clean like polished pans. "'You and I are clean like streams and winds. "'I can tell whenever I see a person whether he is clean, "'and if so, what kind of clean he is. "'We're twins.' "'Ecstatic thought. "'Mother says,' she hesitated uncertainly, Mother says that two souls are sometimes created together and, and in love before they're born. Bilphism gained its easiest convert. After a while he lifted up his head and laughed soundlessly toward the ceiling. When his eyes came back to her he saw that she was angry. "'Why did you laugh?' she cried. "'You've done that twice before. There's nothing funny about our relation to each other. I don't mind playing the fool, and I don't mind having you do it but I can't stand it when we're together. I'm sorry. Oh, don't say you're sorry. If you can't think of anything better than that, just keep quiet. I love you. I don't care. There was a pause. Anthony was depressed. At length Gloria murmured, I'm sorry. I was mean. You weren't. I was the one. Peace was restored. The ensuing moments were so much more sweet and sharp and poignant. There were stars on this stage each playing to an audience of two, the passion of their pretense created the actuality. Here, finally, was the quintessence of self-expression, yet it was probable that, for the most part, their love expressed Gloria rather than Anthony. He felt often like a scarcely tolerated guest at a party she was giving. Telling Mrs. Gilbert had been an embarrassed matter. She sat stuffed into a small chair and listened with an intense and very blinky sort of concentration. She must have known it. For three weeks Gloria had seen no one else, and she must have noticed that this time there was an authentic difference in her daughter's attitude. She had been given special deliveries to post, she had heeded, as all mothers seemed to heed, the hither end of telephone conversations, disguised but still rather warm. Yet she had delicately professed surprise, and declared herself immensely pleased. She doubtless was. So were the geranium plants blossoming in the window boxes, so were the cabbies when the lovers sought the romantic privacy of handsome cabs, quaint device, and the staid bill of fares on which they scribbled, You know I do, pushing it over for the other to see. But between kisses Anthony and this golden girl quarreled incessantly. Now, Gloria, he would cry, please let me explain. Don't explain, kiss me. I don't think that's right. If I hurt your feelings, we ought to discuss it. I don't like this kiss and forget. But I don't want to argue. I think it's wonderful that we can kiss and forget, and when we can't it'll be time to argue." At one time some gossamer difference attained such bulk that Anthony arose and punched himself into his overcoat. For a moment it appeared that the scene of the preceding February was to be repeated, but, knowing how deeply she was moved, he retained his dignity with his pride, and, in a moment, Gloria was sobbing in his arms her lovely face miserable as a frightened little girl's. Meanwhile they kept unfolding to each other, unwillingly, by curious reactions and evasions, by distastes and prejudices and unintended hints of the past. The girl was profoundly incapable of jealousy, and, because he was extremely jealous, this virtue piqued him. He told her recondite incidents of his own life on purpose to arouse some spark of it, but to no avail. She possessed him now, nor did she desire the dead years. "'Oh, Anthony,' she would say, "'always when I'm mean to you I'm sorry afterward. 
I'd give my right hand to save you one little moment's pain. And in that instant her eyes were brimming and she was not aware that she was voicing an illusion. Yet Anthony knew that there were days when they hurt each other purposely, taking almost a delight in the thrust. Incessantly she puzzled him, one hour so intimate and charming, striving desperately toward an unguessed, transcendent union, the next silent and cold, apparently unmoved by any consideration of their love or anything he could say. Often he would eventually trace these portentous reticences to some physical discomfort. Of these she never complained until they were over, or to some carelessness or presumption in him, or to an unsatisfactory dish at dinner. But even then, the means by which she created the infinite distances she spread about herself were a mystery, buried somewhere back in those twenty-two years of unwavering pride. "'Why do you like Muriel?' he demanded one day. "'I don't very much. Then why do you go with her?' "'Just for someone to go with. They're no exertion, those girls. They sort of believe everything I tell them. But I rather like Rachel. I think she's cute, and so clean and slick, don't you?' I used to have other friends, in Kansas City and at school, casual, all of them, girls who just flitted into my range and out of it, for no more reason than that boys took us places together. They didn't interest me after environment stopped throwing us together. Now they're mostly married. What does it matter? They were all just people. You like men better, don't you? Oh, much better. I've got a man's mind. You've got a mind like mine, not strongly gendered either way. Later she told him about the beginnings of her friendship with Blockman. One day in Delmonico's, Gloria and Rachel had come upon Blockman and Mr. Gilbert having luncheon, and curiosity had impelled her to make it a party of four. She had liked him, rather. He was a relief from younger men, satisfied as he was with so little. He humored her, and he laughed, whether he understood her or not. She met him several times, despite the open disapproval of her parents and within a month he had asked her to marry him, tendering her everything from a villa in Italy to a brilliant career on the screen. She had laughed in his face, and he had laughed too. But he had not given up. To the time of Anthony's arrival in the arena, he had been making steady progress. She treated him rather well, except that she had called him always by an invidious nickname, perceiving, meanwhile, that he was figuratively following along beside her as she walked to the fence, ready to catch her if she should fall. The night before the engagement was announced, she told Blockman. It was a heavy blow. She did not enlighten Anthony as to the details, but she implied that he had not hesitated to argue with her. Anthony gathered that the interview had terminated on a stormy note, with Gloria, very cool and unmoved, lying in her corner of the sofa, and Joseph Blockman of films par excellence, pacing the carpet with eyes narrowed and head bowed. Gloria had been sorry for him, but she had judged it best not to show it. In a final burst of kindness she had tried to make him hate her there at the last. But Anthony, understanding that Gloria's indifference was her strongest appeal, judged how futile this must have been. He wondered, often, but quite casually, about Blockman. Finally he forgot him entirely. Heyday one afternoon they found front seats on the sunny roof of a bus, and rode for hours from the fading square up along the sullied river, and then, as the stray beams fled the westward streets, sailed down the turgid avenue, darkening with ominous bees from the department stores. The traffic was clotted and gripped in a patternless jam. The buses were packed four deep like platforms above the crowd as they waited for the moan of the traffic whistle. "'Isn't it good?' cried Gloria. "'Look!' A miller's wagon, stark white with flour, driven by a powdery clown, passed in front of them behind a white horse and his black teammate. What a pity, she complained, they'd look so beautiful in the dusk, if only both horses were white. I'm mighty happy just this minute in this city. Anthony shook his head in disagreement. I think the city's a mountebank, always struggling to approach the tremendous and impressive urbanity ascribed to it, trying to be romantically metropolitan. I don't. I think it is impressive. Momentarily. But it's really a transparent, artificial sort of spectacle. It's got its press-agented stars and its flimsy, unenduring stage settings, and, I'll admit, 
the greatest army of supers ever assembled. He paused, laughed shortly, and added, Technically excellent, perhaps, but not convincing. I'll bet policemen think people are fools, said Gloria thoughtfully, as she watched a large but cowardly lady being helped across the street. He always sees them frightened and inefficient and old. They are, she added. And then, we'd better get off. I told mother I'd have an early supper and go to bed. She says I look tired, damn it. I wish we were married, he muttered soberly. There'll be no good night then, and we can do just as we want. Won't it be good? I think we ought to travel a lot. I want to go to the Mediterranean in Italy, and I'd like to go on the stage some time, say, for about a year. You bet. I'll write a play for you. Won't that be good? And I'll act in it. And then some time when we have more money— Old Adam's death was always thus tactfully alluded to. We'll build a magnificent estate, won't we? Oh, yes, with private swimming pools. Dozens of them, and private rivers. Oh, I wish it were now. Odd coincidence. He had just been wishing that very thing. They plunged like divers into the dark, eddying crowd, and emerging in the cool fifties, sauntered indolently homeward, infinitely romantic to each other. Both were walking alone in a dispassionate garden with a ghost found in a dream. Halcyon days like boats drifting along slow-moving rivers, spring evenings full of a plaintive melancholy that made the past beautiful and bitter, bidding them look back and see that the loves of other summers long gone were dead with the forgotten waltzes of their years. Always the most poignant moments were when some artificial barrier kept them apart. In the theatre their hands would steal together, join, give and return gentle pressures through the long dark. In crowded rooms they would form words with their lips for each other's eyes, not knowing that they were but following in the footsteps of dusty generations, but comprehending dimly that, if truth is the end of life, happiness is a mode of it, to be cherished in its brief and tremulous moment. And then, one fairy night, May became June. Sixteen days now, fifteen, fourteen. Three Digressions just before the engagement was announced, Anthony had gone up to Tarrytown to see his grandfather, who, a little more wizened and grizzled as time played its ultimate chuckling tricks, greeted the news with profound cynicism. "'Oh, you're going to get married, are you?' He said this with such a dubious mildness, and shook his head up and down so many times, that Anthony was not a little depressed. While he was unaware of his grandfather's intentions, he presumed that a large part of the money would come to him. A good deal would go in charities, of course, a good deal to carry on the business of reform. "'Are you going to work?' "'Why,' temporized Anthony, somewhat disconcerted, "'I am working, you know.' "'Ah, uh, I mean work,' said Adam Patch dispassionately. "'I'm not quite sure yet what I'll do. I'm not exactly a beggar, Grandpa,' he asserted with some spirit. The old man considered this with eyes half-closed. Then, almost apologetically, he asked, "'How much do you save a year?' "'Nothing so far.' "'And so, after just managing to get along on your money, you've decided that by some miracle two of you can get along on it.' "'Gloria has some money of her own, enough to buy clothes. How much?' Without considering this question impertinent, Anthony answered it. "'About a hundred a month.' That's altogether about seventy-five hundred a year. Then he added softly, It ought to be plenty. If you have any sense, it ought to be plenty. But the question is whether you have any or not. I suppose it is. It was shameful to be compelled to endure this pious browbeating from the old man, and his next words were stiffened with vanity. I can manage very well. You seem convinced that I'm utterly worthless. At any rate, I came up here simply to tell you that I am getting married in June. Good-bye, sir. With this he turned away, and headed for the door, unaware that, in that instant, his grandfather, for the first time, rather liked him. Wait, called Adam Patch. I want to talk to you. Anthony faced about. Well, sir? Sit down. Stay all night. Somewhat mollified, Anthony resumed his seat. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm going to see Gloria tonight. What's her name? Gloria Gilbert. 
New York girl, someone you know? She's from the Middle West. What business her father in? In a celluloid corporation or trust or something. They're from Kansas City. You going to be married out there? Why, no, sir. We thought we'd be married in New York, rather quietly. Like to have the wedding out here? Anthony hesitated. The suggestion made no appeal to him, but it was certainly the part of wisdom to give the old man, if possible, a proprietary interest in his married life. In addition, Anthony was a little touched. That's very kind of you, Grandpa, but wouldn't it be a lot of trouble? Everything's a lot of trouble. Your father was married here, but in the old house. Why, I thought he was married in Boston. Adam Patch considered. That's true. He was married in Boston. Anthony felt a moment's embarrassment at having made the correction, and he covered it up with words. Well, I'll speak to Gloria about it. Personally, I'd like to, but of course, it's up to the Gilberts, you see. His grandfather drew a long sigh, half closed his eyes, and sank back in his chair. In a hurry? he asked, in a different tone. Not especially. I wonder, began Adam Patch, looking out with a mild, kindly glance at the lilac bushes that rustled against the windows. I wonder if you ever think about the afterlife. Why, sometimes. I think a great deal about the afterlife. His eyes were dim, but his voice was confident and clear. I was sitting here today thinking about what's lying in wait for us, and somehow I began to remember an afternoon nearly sixty-five years ago, when I was playing with my little sister Annie, down where that summer house is now. He pointed out into the long flower garden, his eyes trembling of tears, his voice shaking. I began thinking, and it seemed to me that you ought to think a little more about the afterlife. You ought to be steadier. He paused and seemed to grope about for the right word. More industrious, why? Then his expression altered. His entire personality seemed to snap together like a trap, and when he continued the softness had gone from his voice. Why, when I was just two years older than you, he rasped with a cunning chuckle, I sent three members of the firm of Wren and Hunt to the poorhouse. Anthony started with embarrassment. Well, good-bye, added his grandfather suddenly. You'll miss your train. Anthony left the house unusually elated, and strangely sorry for the old man, not because his wealth could buy him neither youth nor digestion, but because he had asked Anthony to be married there, and because he had forgotten something about his son's wedding that he should have remembered. Richard Caramel, who was one of the ushers, caused Anthony and Gloria much distress in the last few weeks by continually stealing the rays of their spotlight. The Demon Lover had been published in April, and it interrupted the love affair as it may be said to have interrupted everything its author came in contact with. It was a highly original, rather overwritten piece of sustained description concerned with a Don Juan of the New York slums. As Maury and Anthony had said before, as the more hospitable critics were saying then, there was no writer in America with such power to describe the atavistic and unsubtle reactions of that section of society. The book hesitated, then suddenly went. Editions, small at first, then larger, crowded each other week by week. A spokesman of the Salvation Army denounced it as a cynical misrepresentation of all the uplift taking place in the underworld. Clever press agenting spread the unfounded rumor that Gypsy Smith was beginning a libel suit because one of the principal characters was a burlesque of himself. It was borrowed from the public library of Burlington, Iowa, and a Midwestern columnist announced by innuendo that Richard Caramel was in a sanitarium with delirium tremens. The author, indeed, spent his days in a state of pleasant madness. The book was in his conversation three-fourths of the time. He wanted to know if one had heard the latest. He would go into a store and in a loud voice order books to be charged to him, in order to catch a chance morsel of recognition from clerk or customer. He knew to a town in what sections of the country it was selling best. He knew exactly what he cleared on each edition, and when he met anyone who had not read it, or, as it happened only too often, had not heard of it, he succumbed to moody depression. So it was natural for Anthony and Gloria to decide, in their jealousy, that he was so swollen with conceit as to be a bore. 
to dick's great annoyance gloria publicly boasted that she had never read the demon lover and didn't intend to until everyone stopped talking about it as a matter of fact she had no time to read now for the presents were pouring in first a scattering then an avalanche varying from the bric-a-brac of forgotten family friends to the photographs of forgotten poor relations maury gave them an elaborate drinking set which included silver goblets cocktail shaker and bottle openers the extortion from dick was more conventional a tea set from tiffany's from joseph bachman came a simple and exquisite travelling clock with his card there was even a cigarette holder from bounds this touched anthony and made him want to weep indeed any emotion short of hysteria seemed natural in the half-dozen people who were swept up by this tremendous sacrifice to convention the room set aside in the plaza bulged with offerings sent by harvard friends and by associates of his grandfather with remembrances of gloria's farmover days and with rather pathetic trophies from her former beaux which last arrived with esoteric melancholy messages written on cards tucked carefully inside beginning I little thought when, or I'm sure I wish you all the happiness, or even, when you get this I shall be on my way to... The most munificent gift was simultaneously the most disappointing. It was a concession of Adam Patches, a check for five thousand dollars. To most of the presents Anthony was cold. It seemed to him that they would necessitate keeping a chart of the marital status of all their acquaintances during the next half-century. But Gloria exulted in each one, tearing at the tissue paper and excelsior with the rapaciousness of a dog digging for a bone, breathlessly seizing a ribbon or an edge of metal, and finally bringing to light the whole article and holding it up critically, no emotion except rapt interest in her unsmiling face. Look, Anthony! Darn nice, isn't it? No answer until an hour later, when she would give him a careful account of her precise reaction to the gift whether it would have been improved by being smaller or larger, whether she was surprised at getting it, and, if so, just how much surprised. Mrs. Gilbert arranged and rearranged a hypothetical house, distributing the gifts among the different rooms, tabulating articles as second-best clock, or silver to use every day, and embarrassing Anthony and Gloria by semi-facetious references to a room she called the nursery. She was pleased by old Adam's gift, and thereafter had it that he was a very ancient soul, as much as anything else. As Adam Patch never quite decided whether she referred to the advancing senility of his mind, or to some private and psychic schema of her own, it cannot be said to have pleased him. Indeed, he always spoke of her to Anthony as that old woman, the mother, as though she were a character in a comedy he had seen staged many times before. Concerning Gloria, he was unable to make up his mind— she attracted him, but, as she herself told Anthony, he had decided that she was frivolous and was afraid to approve of her. Five days, a dancing platform was being erected on the lawn at Tarrytown. Four days, a special train was chartered to convey the guests to and from New York. Three days, the diary. She was dressed in blue silk pajamas and standing by her bed with her hand on the light to put the room in darkness, when she changed her mind, and, opening a table drawer, brought out a little black book, a line-a-day diary. This she had kept for seven years. Many of the pencil entries were almost illegible, and there were notes and references to nights and afternoons long since forgotten, for it was not an intimate diary, even though it began with the immemorial, I am going to keep a diary for my children. Yet, as she thumbed over the pages, the eyes of many men seemed to look out at her from their half-obliterated names. With one she had gone to New Haven for the first time, in 1908, when she was sixteen and padded shoulders were fashionable at Yale. She had been flattered because Touchdown Michaud had rushed her all evening. She sighed, remembering the grown-up satin dress she had been so proud of, and the orchestra playing Yama Yama My Yama Man and Jungle Town. So long ago— the names Eltinge Reardon, Jim Parsons, Curly McGregor, Kenneth Cohen, Fisheye Fry, whom she had liked for being so ugly, Carter Kirby, he had sent her a present, so had Tudor Baird, Marty Reffer, the first man she had been in love with for more than a day, and Stuart Holcomb, 
who had run away with her in his automobile and tried to make her marry him by force. And Larry Fenwick, whom she had always admired because he had told her one night that if she wouldn't kiss him, she could get out of his car and walk home. What a list! And, after all, an obsolete list. She was in love now, set for the eternal romance that was to be the synthesis of all romance, yet sad for these men, and these moonlights, and for the thrill she had had, and the kisses. The past, her past, oh, what a joy! She had been exuberantly happy. Turning over the pages, her eyes rested idly on the scattered entries of the past four months. She read the last few carefully. April 1st. I know Bill Carstairs hates me because I was so disagreeable, but I hate to be sentimentalized over sometimes. We drove out to the rockier country club, and the most wonderful moon kept shining through the trees. My silver dress is getting tarnished. Funny how one forgets the other nights at rockier, with Kenneth Cohen when I loved him so. April 3rd. After two hours of Schroeder, who, they inform me, has millions, I've decided that this matter of sticking to things wears one out, particularly when the things concerned are men. There's nothing so often overdone, and from today I swear to be amused. We talked about love. How banal! With how many men have I talked about love? April 11th. Patch actually called up today, and when he forswore me about a month ago he fairly raged out the door. I'm gradually losing faith in any man being susceptible to fatal injuries. April 20th. Spent the day with Anthony. Maybe I'll marry him some time. I kind of like his ideas. He stimulates all the originality in me. Blockhead came around about ten in his new car and took me out Riverside Drive. I liked him tonight. He's so considerate. He knew I didn't want to talk, so he was quiet all during the ride. April 21st. Woke up thinking of Anthony, and sure enough he called and sounded sweet on the phone. So I broke a date for him. Today I feel I'd break anything for him, including the Ten Commandments in my neck. He's coming at eight, and I shall wear pink and look very fresh and starched. She paused here, remembering that after he had gone that night, she had undressed with the shivering April air streaming in the windows. Yet it seemed she had not felt the cold, warmed by the profound banalities burning in her heart. The next entry occurred a few days later. April 24th. I want to marry Anthony, because husbands are so often husbands, and I must marry a lover. There are four general types of husbands. One, the husband who always wants to stay in in the evening, has no vices, and works for a salary. Totally undesirable. Two, the atavistic master, whose mistress one is, to wait on his pleasure. This sort always considers every pretty woman shallow, a sort of peacock with arrested development. 3. Next comes the worshipper, the idolater of his wife, and all that is his, to the utter oblivion of everything else. This sort demands an emotional actress for a wife, God. It must be an exertion to be thought righteous. 4. And Anthony, a temporarily passionate lover with wisdom enough to realize when it has flown, and that it must fly. And I want to get married to Anthony. What grub-worms women are to crawl on their bellies through colorless marriages! Marriage was created not to be a background, but to need one. Mine is going to be outstanding. It can't, shan't be the setting. It's going to be the performance, the live, lovely, glamorous performance, and the world shall be the scenery. I refuse to dedicate my life to posterity. Surely one owes as much to the current generation as to one's unwanted children. What a fate, to grow rotund and unseemly, to lose my self-love, to think in terms of milk, oatmeal, nurse, diapers. Dear dream children, how much more beautiful you are, dazzling little creatures who flutter, all dream children must flutter, on golden, golden wings. Such children, however, poor dear babies, have little in common with the wedded state. June 7th. Moral question. Was it wrong to make Blockman love me? Because I did really make him. He was almost sweetly sad tonight. How opportune it was that my throat is swollen plunk together, and tears were easy to muster. But he's just the past, buried already in my plentiful lavender. June 8th. And today I've promised not to chew my mouth. Well, I won't, I suppose. But if he'd only ask me not to eat! 
blowing bubbles that's what we're doing anthony and me and we blew such beautiful ones today and they'll explode and then we'll blow more and more i guess bubbles just as big and just as beautiful until all the soap and water is used up on this note the diary ended her eyes wandered up the page over the june eighths of nineteen twelve nineteen ten nineteen o seven the earliest entry was scrawled in the plump bulbous hand of a sixteen-year-old girl it was the name bob lamar and a word she could not decipher then she knew what it was and knowing she found her eyes misty with tears there in a graying blur was the record of her first kiss faded as his intimate afternoon on a rainy veranda seven years before she seemed to remember something one of them had said that day and yet she could not remember her tears came faster until she could scarcely see the page she was crying she told herself because she could remember only the rain and the wet flowers in the yard and the smell of the damp grass after a moment she found a pencil and holding it unsteadily drew three parallel lines beneath the last entry then she printed fini in large capitals put the book back in the drawer and crept into bed breath of the cave back in his apartment after the bridal dinner anthony snapped out his lights and feeling impersonal and fragile as a piece of china waiting on a serving table got into bed it was a warm night a sheet was enough for comfort and through his wide open windows came sound evanescent and summery alive with remote anticipation he was thinking that the young years behind him hollow and colorful had been lived in facile and vacillating cynicism upon the recorded emotions of men long dust and there was something beyond that he knew now there was the union of his soul with gloria's whose radiant fire and freshness was the living material of which the dead beauty of books was made from the night into his high-walled room there came persistently that evanescent and dissolving sound something the city was tossing up and calling back again like a child playing with a ball in harlem the bronx gramercy park and along the waterfronts in little parlors or on pebble-strewn moon-flooded roofs a thousand lovers were making this sound crying little fragments of it into the air all the city was playing with this sound out there in the blue summer dark throwing it up and calling it back promising that in a little while life would be beautiful as a story promising happiness and by that promise giving it it gave love hope in its own survival it could do no more it was then that a new note separated itself jarringly from the soft crying of the night it was a noise from an area away within a hundred feet from his rear window the noise of a woman's laughter it began low incessant and whining some servant maid with her fellow he thought and then it grew in volume and became hysterical until it reminded him of a girl he had seen overcome with nervous laughter at a vaudeville performance then it sank receded only to rise again and include words a coarse joke some bit of obscure horseplay he could not distinguish it would break off for a moment and he would just catch the low rumble of a man's voice then begin again interminably at first annoying then strangely terrible he shivered and getting up out of bed went to the window it had reached a high point tensed and stifled almost the quality of a scream then it ceased and left behind it a silence empty and menacing as the greater silence overhead anthony stood by the window a moment longer before he returned to his bed he found himself upset and shaken try as he might to strangle his reaction some animal quality in that unrestrained laughter had grasped his imagination and for the first time in four months aroused his old aversion and horror toward all the business of life the room had grown smothery he wanted to be out in some cool and bitter breeze miles above the cities and to live serene and detached back in the corners of his mind life was that sound out there that ghastly reiterated female sound oh my god he cried drawing in his breath sharply burying his face in the pillows he tried in vain to concentrate upon the details of the next day morning in the gray light he found that it was only five o'clock he regretted nervously that he had awakened so early 
he would appear fagged at the wedding. He envied Gloria, who could hide her fatigue with careful pigmentation. In his bathroom he contemplated himself in the mirror and saw that he was unusually white. Half a dozen small imperfections stood out against the morning pallor of his complexion. And overnight he had grown the faint stubble of a beard. The general effect, he fancied, was unprepossessing, haggard, half unwell. On his dressing-table were spread a number of articles, which he told over carefully with suddenly fumbling fingers, their tickets to California, the book of traveller's checks, his watch, set to the half-minute, the key to his apartment, which he must not forget to give to Moray, and, most important of all, the ring. It was of platinum set around with small emeralds. Gloria had insisted on this. She had always wanted an emerald wedding ring, she said. It was the third present he had given her. First had come the engagement ring, and then a little gold cigarette case. He would be giving her many things now, clothes and jewels, and friends and excitement. It seemed absurd that from now on he would pay for all her meals. It was going to cost. He wondered if he had not underestimated for this trip, and if he had not better cash a larger check. The question worried him. Then the breathless impendency of the event swept his mind clear of details. This was the day, unsought, unsuspected six months before, but now breaking in yellow light through his east window, dancing along the carpet, as though the sun were smiling at some ancient and reiterated gag of his own. Anthony laughed in a nervous one-syllable snort. "'By God!' he muttered to himself. "'I'm as good as married!' End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part One of Three